Good. Well, let me make some preliminary comments at this point. This will be a fairly short uh, talk. I only have 41 slides. Um, I wanted to um, make a, I don't know, for some of you, perhaps a slight apology because we usually talk about about um, things pertaining to energy or biodiversity or uh, various ways of improving the planet. And my topic a week ago on birds and this topic on electric airplanes are pretty small parts of the picture, but our title happily is Pathways to a Sustainable Planet and certainly um, um, although it's not as solid perhaps as uh, cement and concrete next week and dams uh, in late April, it, um, they're kind of flighty topics, but uh, nonetheless interesting and uh, particularly to me. So I, I had to scratch my head a little bit to come up with topics that haven't been covered before. Um, and uh, another one of these last week or this week have been really covered to any extent. So um, I'm getting into some of my more personal life uh, here to talk about airplanes. And I'm starting off with the image in the left side. That is called a coot. And um, that's why my email has that uh, odd beginning. Uh, the coot bird, probably you all know, it's a, not a duck but a, some kind, sometimes called a mud hen. Uh, it's, it's along the coastal edges of the lakes here around Madison. It has a beak, not a bill, a web, uh, a lobed toes instead of webbed toes and fairly small wings. The reason that the designer of the coot uh, chose that name is because the wings there are much lower than you see on a typical flying boat or amphibian. And that requires a lot of dihedral, that is the wings tilt up a little bit so they won't catch in the water. Um, but um, it resembles the bird because the bird has a tendency to run along the water and then gradually accelerate in what's called a ground effect or a cushion of, of air under the flying wing and then gradually uh, increase altitude. Most ducks uh, go up at about 45 degrees directly off the water. A duck has a good sized wing and uh, a web foot and it can just leap into the water and go right off. And um, the coot just doesn't do that. And so the designer who wanted to have a craft that would be more maneuverable on the water and not have wingtip floats catching and that sort of thing decided to name it after the bird. And so I've been enthused about coots almost since, uh, well, I learned to fly in 1959 up in Sault Ste. Marie on pontoons or float plane and never liked the idea of floats because I felt that uh, they provided a certain instability. I wanted to be lower on the water and have the hull that I was sitting in right on the water. So I wouldn't be, I was worried about catching a wingtip and a crosswind. And so, uh, I never could afford a commercially available one. They cost way beyond my means as a medical student. But after settling down with a family, uh, I thought it would be a nice hobby to get involved in building one. And I heard about this plane that you could build from scratch. Back in 1970 or so, uh, they didn't have kits for building airplanes. You had to build them from scratch, although the designer did provide a fiberglass shell for the hull. and. Um, so I had never handled a power tool in my hands ever in my life. And so I was not mechanically gifted or trained, but instead I, I decided to do it. And, and um, I, I thought it would take me three years. When the plans came, it was evident right away that it would be at least five years. It ended up taking me 11 years uh, to build that plane that you see on the left. Uh, but I flew it for uh, 10 years after building it and enjoyed it a great deal before I traded it in, uh, so to speak, I bought it, sold it uh, 
it sold a different one uh, and flew that for 18 years. So I've had about 28 years of flying this type of plane and enjoyed it immensely. Uh, I like water flying uh, more than landing on runways. And um, I like the, the proximity of water. You, you basically, around Wisconsin, there are always lakes and rivers around. And it's like having a permanent runway. In case of any need to uh, land, you usually have some, in Wisconsin, some water within gliding range or uh, practically within gliding range. So that was my interest in the coot. And I uh, then around 2000 got a fuel efficient car uh, called a Honda Insight. And I had two of those Insights over 12 years and really liked them. They were giving me about 50 miles to the gallon. And uh, they were quiet little cars with good sound system inside. My wife one day said, you know, Richard, you're, you've got a very noisy fuel inefficient plane. Uh, you get 10, 10 miles to the gallon, it's noisy as all get out. And uh, why don't you get a plane that's like your car? And so I thought about that. Um, and at about that time, they started flying electric planes at Oshkosh, the annual air show at Oshkosh, and um, supported by the electric, uh, by the Experimental Aircraft Association. So I sold the coot in 2011 and started getting quite interested in electric planes. Um, the picture on the right is taken from a, uh, a meeting in California organized by a physician there who promoted electric planes. And he and his helpers staged that rather striking uh, image, not an image, it was actually there. They, they used, of course, as you can see, a stepladder. And there were several talks given on the, an idealized wing. There's a wing that gives more lift at, um, and, and, lift is emphasized more than speed. And that wing has that particular shape. It's, uh, I won't go into any more details about it, but it was, there were several talks given on that type of wing. Notice that the fuselage is, uh, has a very low drag aspect to it. So drag was another feature that was discussed at, at a great deal at the meeting. And so I posed them on the beginning as, a, as, a, as an opposite, uh, the plane on the, on the left is meant for water and reasonable speed, uh, no concern about noise, no concern about fuel efficiency. And the one on the right was an idealized concept because if you're going to electrify it, you want to have a plane that's very efficient. So I'll lead you then into um, my endeavors, but before getting there, I'll elaborate a little bit on the picture on the right. Um, these are a, a whole bunch of, of ways to make electric motors uh, efficient in the air. The top left one is a, a special plane that was uh, called the, the uh, uh, Sonex Xenos, X-E-N-O-S. It was uh, had a slightly longer wing than the sportier plane. And uh, the Sonex company in Oshkosh uh, were some of the first people to electrify their plane. You know, I was giving lectures up at Oshkosh about the coot, and I'd get finish my lecture and be walking outside the tent or the small little building, and they'd have one of these electric Sonex planes. And I wondered when they would ever get it in the air. When they finally did, it was only flown for about 15 minutes, and it ran out of battery power. I think partly because the plane was not really idealized very well to the image that I just showed you before. It looks fairly clean, but um, they certainly didn't have enough efficient batteries back in the early 2000s. So it never got very far. Uh, what you see now on the right upper and the photo below that are examples of the um, Pipistrel. This is a company in Slovenia. And the one on the upper right uh, was a plane that won an X prize for having the greatest fuel efficiency a capacity for four people and um, uh, excellent range, all electric. 
Um, so that was quite an accomplishment. They took two gliders and sort of fused them together. So there are two, uh, if you look closely, it's just a black and white photograph, but there's a cabin there for two people and a cabin over here for two people and the motor and batteries were in the center. And um, they deserve that prize. And they also designed another aircraft here, which I'll show you about in a few minutes, um, a conventional plane with conventional internal combustion engine, but extraordinarily efficient. These other things are kind of dreams. Uh, the point I'm getting across here is the small motors. When you have small motors, as opposed to an internal combustion engine, you can place them in all sorts of locations with little struts to attach them. Uh, you can put ducts around them if you like here and here, or you can attach them way out on the wing tips or put all kinds of little uh, struts around them and so on. It, these are pretty imaginative drawings uh, that were that I got from, from one of the talks out in California from this innovative, um, subject that the doctor out there was was uh, having annual meetings to advocate these aircrafts. Um, any questions so far? Well, this is a Pipistrel ad taken directly from their website. And it's um, uh, the plane that I showed before, it's called the Panthera. It's the sleekest, most efficient, perfectly designed four-seater as advertised on their website with retractable gear for comfortable and affordable travels. Then they, they became um, uh, interested in making planes that were could land on unprepared terrain. And they called this the Explorer. They carried that idea a little bit further and, and came up with a trainer, uh, a plane ideally set for uh, training people, also towing gliders, that sort of thing. Uh, Slovenia is a mountainous place. You can see lots of mountains around to give you good thermals for soaring. And then finally, they wound up with the Velis Electro, the first ever type certified electric powered airplane, fully approved for pilot training. And they sold some of these to um, a flying club in California. And they you really want to have them two at a time so one can be teaching while the other one is getting charged. And uh, the idea of transferring batteries in and out of planes for charging has not caught on very well. There are too many uh, redundancies and tricky installations to make um, sliding fully charged batteries back and forth to make that practical in an aircraft. So that's the Pipistrel story. Um, they're still doing very good work, uh, but it's not moving all that quickly, um, partly because the batteries are just advancing, I think, very slowly. Anyway, there are several other ideas that can come up with a, an electric motor. What you can do is uh, a propeller, a typical propeller uh, that is used in aviation um, rotates at, a, at a revolutions per minute, generally between 2000 and 2800 RPM or revolutions per minute. And those are generally have two blades. Sometimes you'll get three, rarely more than that. But you'll notice in these examples with an electric motor, you can use simply a rheostat and choose any speed that you want. Um, and um, uh, you can have blades that are differently shaped and shorter, perhaps wider across and many more blades on, on a motor uh, in both of these examples. They're both twin engine aircraft. This looks like a, uh, either a tandem or a single place. Another one of these have been built. They're just uh, drawings, uh, but they're uh, trying to get the point across in this slide of how you can use a modified propeller in addition to a, a small efficient motor or series of motors to substitute for um, a noisier fuel burning uh, propulsion system. The other thing that they talked about a lot at this meeting in California was the idea of pocket uh, airports. Um, let me just admit, Doug, here, I can find a way to do that. Okay, welcome, Doug. Um, the idea here is to take a large airport, I'm not sure if this is, if this is uh, Los Angeles or some other one, it doesn't much matter, but the idea is that in the parking roof, 
of, uh, of this airport, you could have little pocket airports for um, commuter, small commuter electric aircraft to bring people in from the outlying area and avoid a vast amount of traffic coming to the airport and all the congestion that uh, that brings. <clears throat> it would give the airport more space from <clears throat> so much parking and congestion and allow people to uh, be flown off the roof of the airport to their uh, respective air parks. So this would be good at large aircraft hubs, uh, airport hubs. Uh, that was another idea they had. Well, I started going to those meetings around 12 years ago and about that time, a Chinese company uh, called Unique, uh, Y-U-N-E-E-C, uh, came out with this aircraft. I'm not quite sure how they came up with 430, but that was the number of the plane. And I thought it was pretty cool. It's a picture uh, someone took of me uh, standing next to that plane. It had been approved very rapidly by the FAA uh, because of perhaps a bit of pressure from the Experimental Aircraft Association uh, to bring them in and begin to sell them at Oshkosh. And uh, uh, I was really excited about this plane. I thought it was sleek looking and side-by-side uh, -side seating. It looked like just the plane uh, to accept that it was not amphibious, of course. I, I knew that it, I would not likely find an electric amphibious plane because they consume a vast amount of energy to get off the water compared with off of land and have to be designed differently. It doesn't make them quite so aerodynamic. So I was prepared to give up water and uh, got quite excited about the plane. Um, was about to put in an order when uh, they started competing also for the X prize that I told you about that, that um, Pipistrel won. They were competing against Pipistrel and they, they made a four place one. It was quite different, but they used a, also a fairly thin tail and instead of using an inverted V, which you should have done to make the forces of banking and turning more compatible and more consistent with birds, they had an upright V, which is inherently um, not a good idea unless you have an extremely strong structure here in the tail. And they lost uh, the tail on uh, their test pilot. He's a good friend of the owner of the company. He felt terrible about it. And the, the company basically retracted totally for a few years and went back to selling uh, model planes and they got out of this movement. Uh, so it was just, it was a, uh, I don't imagine I would have had that problem if I had uh, got this plane, but I, I, I was concerned about the upright V tail and uh, uh, I went, wanted to at least discuss it with them uh, about how strong that was, but never had to get to there. So that uh, perhaps gave me a little forewarning of what I was up against. This is a more modern version of their unique uh, that was only sold in Europe. They did not attempt to bring it to the States after that. <laughs> Quite a different plane, but uh, and with not such a long precarious tail. And they, they did not use the V, they used a horizontal stabilizer up out of the slipstream. So <laughs> much better design plane, but uh, never came over to the United States. So I said goodbye to the unique. And at Oshkosh, I saw a plane that uh, was basically a glider that was electrified and it looked a little bit like this, only this was a, a much nicer one, uh, built in uh, also in um, Slovenia called the Electra Flyer. And I, per I ended up after quite a bit of negotiation, purchased this one, uh, it was a prototype which is a dangerous thing to get involved with and it wasn't finished, it was only half built. It lacked batteries, controller, which is an important device to care to convert uh, direct current from a battery into three phase alternating current for a motor and a battery monitoring system, which is very important to make sure that the cells in the battery remain interconnected and don't get out of line with each other uh, to lead to abnormal currents after the system is shut down. Um, so I um, went ahead against my better judgment because I was so excited about getting started and impatient. And so, but one thing I'd, I had to realize was that if you go to this idealized 
glider type, uh, self-launching glider, you have to get a license for them. I had forgotten about that. I only had a license to fly seaplanes and land planes. I had done a bit of soaring, but uh, never got a license. So I, I had to uh, went, go down to uh, Beloit for training in this plane and down to uh, um, Waukegan, I think, Illinois, for training in this plane, which is a self-launching electric glider. And I spent some time doing that, also uh, taking licenses and exams and all the rest. I wasn't prepared for that and um, reluctantly was kind of drawn into the necessity um, because my idea was not this sort of thing. Uh, this is what sailplane pilots do. They get a tow from your tow plane that you can see here directly in front of me. I took this picture. Um, this is an aircraft made by, by Piper, I believe, Piper Pawnee, and it's got these braces here. It's a very sturdy uh, little plane used for towing, uh, well, sometimes crop dusting, but in this case, towing gliders. And this is Southern Wisconsin around the Beloit area. Um, and you notice this little, this little uh, yarn, piece of yarn here over the compass, it's supposed to be going straight up. When it doesn't go straight up, it means you're not flying very well. Um, you need to have a, uh, um, be perfectly coordinated in your turn in terms of bank and changing yaw or, or directional control in order to have that yarn go straight up. And I've gotten a little sloppy in my um, flying. This was about, uh, let's see, um, 30 or 40 years after I'd learned to fly. And here I was flying along with this yarn off a bit to the side. Um, it uh, indicates you really need to pay attention to what you're doing if you want to be a good sailplane pilot. And also, um, you have to pay attention to your altitude. There is in most sailplanes a little, you, you can look at the instrument panel, but it's more efficient if you just listen most of the altimeters there are very sensitive and they tell you if you're climbing and the pitch goes up so it's sort of like a little whining whistle and then it'll go down if you're losing altitude and so um, <clears throat> you're constantly listening for this whine also i should point out the sky uh, the sky is um, perfect for soaring you will not find days like that out of 365 a year. You will not find more than a handful of days like that around Wisconsin anymore. These clouds, it's not a clear blue sky and it's not an overcast sky, it's halfway between. That's just what you want. You want to have the um, uh, enough sun coming down between the clouds to warm the land and then for the land to give up its moisture into these cumulus clouds. And you fly up into the base, almost to the base, you want to be legal and stay 500 feet below them uh, and clear so that you don't bump into somebody else doing the same thing up there. But, uh, but you circle around and sometimes you'll actually see um, uh, birds up there, eagles in particular, but sometimes other birds uh, soaring along or you can follow them on the way up. And that uh, is probably the main excitement that a glider pilot has in terms of communing with nature. Otherwise, you're so far away you see the expanse of the land, uh, but you don't, um, uh, in my opinion, have much of the fun, of visual fun, because the land is so far below you. Now, there are exceptions to that, of course. If you're near a mountain range, you can do what's called ridge soaring, where you just fly back and forth in front of the ridge on um, currents that are going up the ridge. And then if you happen to live near Lake Tahoe, you can do lens flying, where there's a lens a rising air around the lake and you can climb in that. But other than those three types of flying, um, you're, you're kind of restricted. And I'm used to flying along rivers and over lakes and things like that. And, and I did not find this it was an interesting challenge, but I, as, a, as a pastime, I did not find it as thrilling and as much fun as, as uh, the flying in the coot that I've been doing. Any Richard, questions? I had a question. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, on the Electra Flyer, a couple of uh, slides back, I noticed that the wingtips are bent upward at the ends. And, and what advantage would that be? Good question, Lee. I, I think it just allows 
uh, the heir to um, uh, add, it adds extra lift without adding quite as much length. Um, these are detachable and the plane does not have quite enough lift uh, without them. Ah, and, okay. and so to also many hangar doors are, are not wide enough to take the full width. So these are quickly detachable and um, they make it convenient for getting into a standard hanger and it just adds extra lift. It's much easier to, to attach them if they're angled up like this. It also, uh, if you look at jets today, you'll see that many of them have vertical, uh, the Boeing jets have vertical uh, things here. They, they do, it does help in dealing with what are called wingtip vortices and uh, uh, adds to general lift, even with that angle. It's not idealized, but it's it's a combination of factors that made it appropriate for this company to choose that design. Okay, it's, it's a complex question with a I, I think uh, a good, I, I think a good part of that uh, design is to add stability. Uh, you'll note that the wing itself has no dihedral and by having the outer portions of the wing angle up, that gives you some lateral stability. Um, it's kind of common in um, model gliders, actually. So, um, yeah. as well as the other point you had about removing the wings and stuff, but it doesn't really affect the vortices that much in this particular design. It's yeah. rather unusual. I want to add something on the, the, the whole so soaring scene, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I have enough glider time that I could have got my li license in it, and uh, I've been around it a bit, although I never had a rating. Um, the glider or sailplane scene uh, is about the challenge of it. Not, not sightseeing, as you say, is it's terrible for sightseeing, but uh, uh, getting up and finding thermals and uh, say sailing from one to the next you climb in one to the base of the cloud and then you glide off um some of the really high performance ones for if you're a mile high above the ground you could glide for 50 miles without doing anything else uh, the the really high performance the mid performance are about maybe 20 to 30 miles uh, for, for a mile up so you like one thermal to the next, you find them and you climb and, and you just keep going. You go hundreds and hundreds of miles cross country in that fashion, even here in the Midwest on the right day. And so for the, the sailplane pilot, uh, they get like merit badges. They have badges of, of different uh, silver and gold and diamond for, for different distances and also for for seeing up for, for time a lot. You can stay up for hours and hours and hours uh, just just in thermal type things, much less the, the mountain waves and stuff like that. Um, Thank you, Alan. I, I uh, appreciate the, that. The greatest distances in sailplanes are, are like a thousand miles. Yeah. So uh, that, it, it, it's a whole different thing. So back to your planes. <laughs> I agree with you, Alan. I, I'm glad you brought that up. It is does aid stability, and it does. You are a sailboat guy, and and uh, so you can appreciate perhaps more than I um, the joy in simple achievement of uh, handling the wind, letting the wind do the work for you. It, it is a compelling movement, and the instructors who taught me soaring are just full of enthusiasm and deep, genuine pleasure. Um, so I agree with you completely. It just didn't happen to turn me on uh, so much. I, I, I later, as I will show you, found the perfect plane for me because it, it allows electric flight without going into all of the uh, efficient electric flight, without going into all the details and folder all of soaring uh, with a glider. But I, I do, appreciate your point of view and particularly the point of view of my instructors. But just going into a little bit of background about why I personally, um, it was fun, but it didn't turn me on to the degree I, that I had, had hoped. So I ended up with this 
explain now here you can see that uh, I've, I've removed just for taxing purposes, the extenders are not on here. Uh, the windshield is none, so I'm protecting my eyes with, with the special uh, uh, eye protectors because I wanted to hear things more clearly and uh, I just wanted, the plane was only half assembled. Um, it, uh, I was starting to deal with uh, um, cooling the motor, so I wanted to see how well it taxied, I wanted to see how well it steered, how well it braked, and those sorts of things. So just after a shower, uh, I drove my little insight up there and I had a good mechanic working with me and uh, uh, it was fun. Um, I actually invited this group of people uh, up to the hangar, I think it was the next day and on a Saturday and it's not always a very good day for, for uh, Plato people to come up for a visit. I think the only person who came that day was Don Reeder. And uh, uh, I felt relieved that only Don came because I was terribly embarrassed. Uh, there's a thing called a controller, right? You can't see it here, it's obstructed by the propeller, but the controller quit the next day. <laughs> and uh, uh, Al checking my mechanic worked with me for months and months and finally had to ship it off to California to have that rebuilt. Uh, we had no end of problems with that plane. The batteries, uh, I did not have the front ones installed, but when they, they came later, um, they were defective and ultimately led to a fire and lost the whole plane. So it was a, it was a bad news story. The guy I bought it from, I didn't like. Um, I, I should never have been too impa so impatient. And this all happened two years later in 2014 in October. So I, I just, I almost quit. I, I was so depressed and discouraged. I thought, I'm just gonna give up on this. Lost a lot of money. And um, around Christmas time of that year, I remembered hearing about a guy out in the West Coast who had a different kind of, of an idea. He had a true ultralight. Now using an ultralight is really simplifies things. You don't have to worry about glider endorsements, soaring endorsements, ultralight. If you can drive a car, and you have some basic flying skills, you can legally fly an ultralight. So this is the guy, Mark Beerley, that I heard about. And he's out in California. He's a pioneer in the development of efficient ultralight aircraft. This particularly happened to him. He had quite a business of people and made ultralights for 20 or so years out in California. And when the recession of 2008-9 came along, uh, the bottom dropped out of the market. And he thought the only way to, he did not want to go back and work for another airplane company, been in private business long enough that he decided to, to offer electrifying all his planes that he'd sold. And um, so knowing that, and he had an extra one that he was willing to sell me already built, um, but it had a, a shorter wing. It had the, a wing that was 26 feet long. And he said, uh, I can sell you a kit in addition to the plane so that while you're flying the plane and getting used to it, you can build a longer wing that's 28 feet. And I'm so glad he did that. He, he really anticipated my needs very well. And uh, six months later in the middle of 2015, he brought out uh, this plane that some of you uh, saw. I did, did have, I think, perhaps it was a Monday morning, but this is Ulrika here, uh, Dieter Lee and Ulrika, are you in the audience? Ah, you may be missing out, but there you are. And I'm not sure who took this picture, perhaps Dottie, uh, but, but this is the plane here called um, an electric gull or e-gull. And I had a demonstration uh, with, the, uh, with this group, the Plato group in uh, October of 2015. Uh, and I was talking a little bit about it there and took it up to fly. Notice that the motor is not very well cowled and the propeller is red. Uh, I later modified both things to improve its performance. I uh, did a bunch of other things too. Uh, I'll give you some, show you some data later about, about uh, the effects of the longer wing. I also uh, uh, flew it to Oshkosh, that's a 90 mile flight. Uh, normally uh, the batteries in this plane could give me a range of about 40, 45 miles, but rather than risk at uh, only one stop, I was wanted to be very safe, so I arranged for two stops. So there were 
three 30 mile um, flights uh, back to back to take me from uh, Sauk City to Oshkosh. And it was on display there for the, the week of the uh, EA convention. And this picture was taken by Mark who was flying next to me with an internal combustion powered plane. He didn't have to land as often as I did, but he helped uh, keep me company as we were making our way there. And, and the final point, I think I really enjoyed the quietness of this plane along the Wisconsin River. I wanted to be able to fly along the river and enjoy its beauty. I like to see not only wildlife, but I like to see people enjoying it. And I don't want to disturb either one of them. And I felt for the first time that I could do this and fly low at treetop, tree height elevation, and uh, which is still pretty legal in an ultra light. And uh, so I enjoyed it for about five years. Uh, it's been a, a real uh, delight. I'll go into a couple of details about it. Uh, you need to have an efficient charging system. There are two chargers in the nose of this plane to give a good balance <clears throat> and also to provide this very com convenience of being able to charge it with two different plugs. You, whenever you charge a battery, of course, you have to have a charger. Many, many of us have them at home. If our batteries are dead, we have a little charger in our tool shed or something uh, so that we can convert 110 volts into uh, um, alternating current into a direct current for charging up batteries. And this one has two of them, and you can use them simultaneously. This is Mark, the designer, testing them out and checking out with his voltmeter how they're working. The nice thing about it is if you have this kind of charging support, um, you can uh, have the plane charged up in about twice the amount of time you're in the air. So if I were to go to a half hour flight, I would just take an hour while I'm sweeping out the hangar, doing other things, tidying up to have the plane fully charged before I left. You could, of course, leave it on an overnight trickle charge, but having heard stories of other planes burning, including my own, I decided that the former one, that it would be smarter not to leave it on an overnight charge, uh, if at all possible, but to just uh, charge it right after my flight. And this is some of the work that I did. Uh, this is a very crude graph, forgive me for the, uh, not having it in better shape, but basically I'm plotting on the ordinate here, the number of kilowatts that I'm using. I could measure the kilowatts in the plane. And generally uh, you take off maybe at, at 20 kilowatts, but very, very quickly you taper it back to 10 kilowatts in crude. And it's uh, the red line here is range. And you just have to take off the pH here and it works out in miles. So if you're flying along between eight and 10 kilowatts, you can have a range theoretically of uh, 60 uh, to 70 miles um, with uh, some of these. I'm, I'm not sure which graph. I think it was this blue line that I used for calculating the red line in, in miles. Anyway, it was uh, there were different ways with the shorter wing, with the longer wing, with the different propeller, and I got similar shaped curves. The point I want to make is that kilowatts, in case you're not familiar with the term, is, is that's equivalent to about 13 and a half horsepower. Imagine flying on 13 and a half horsepower. But that's how efficient this plane was. There are no struts. It's just as clean as a whistle uh, in every way you want to look at it. And at 20 uh, kilowatts, uh, the plane actually went between 85 and 95 miles an hour. That's highly illegal. You're not supposed to do that. So don't talk to any FAA official, uh, please, because uh, the speed limit in the air is 63 miles per hour for an ultralight. And uh, Mark Beerley does not advertise that because it's just, it's such a clean plane. Uh, for some reason or other, the FAA has decided that ultralights shouldn't go any faster than 63 miles an hour. They also have weight limits that have nothing to do with electricity. They have to do with fuel tanks. And so, Mark has to talk with the FAA about this fuel tank of a battery and its weight. And it's, it's crazy, but the, these planes have been around for um, 15 years now and the FAA still hasn't gotten around to adapting to electric ultralights. Their rules and regulations have nothing to do with, with electric ultralights. A um, little pointer here, before I went off to Oshkosh, Mark flew right next to me. I was a little worried about flying in tight formation and Mark said, don't worry, 
just go straight. Don't change your altitude or your direction. And I'll be right above you. And we tufted, that is, we took little, little bits of red yarn and attached them with tapes all around where we had modified the cowling to make it smoother. And also, and, and he was able to take pictures of me from his plane uh, and looking at whether these tufts were going straight or not, or whether they were flapping in the breeze. And um, it actually worked very well. I haven't shown the closest tufts because they, that wouldn't show the background flying over the Wisconsin River here. But uh, it worked extraordinarily well. And we found that this was designed perfectly. The only place we saw some flapping around was a little um, um, fairing around the front of the wing that wasn't properly sealed down. And so we sealed that down before I went off to Oshkosh. Um, so lots of things need to be done um, if you're going to have an electric plane, particularly if, you're, um, if you want it to be efficient and to give you a decent range. Another thing that both of us uh, thought about for a while, we went to some of these meetings out in California, Innovative Aircraft, and we met an Australian guy by the name of Josh and a Californian guy, and they got together and wrote up a brochure for us telling us how much we could make the plane even quieter if we put a ducted fan on the back. So this is the duct here in black and the fan has multiple blades and uh, they sold us the whole thing with a handshake. Um, in aviation, uh, a lot of pilots work with one another with a handshake. Uh, and that means that if you're happy, um, you just pay your money and enjoy it. If you're not happy, you can uh, get a full refund for it. And this is uh, Mark doing the initial test flight at Sauk City Airport. And uh, we thought it was pretty cool at first, but uh, it turned out we should have known better and thinking more seriously about it. This shroud or duct uh, significantly reduces uh, the beautiful clean lines of the plane. In a less efficient plane, less clean plane, it might not be so noticeable. Uh, so that was a serious problem that the, you lose range for it to be a little bit quieter. Another thing is it was quieter for me taking that photograph, but it wasn't any quieter for Mark because the uh, deducted fan works most efficiently at a higher RPM. And so it was actually noisier uh, for the individual in the plane. If you want to listen to your radio or, or even have headphones for the radio, it's a noisier environment. So on both counts, we decided to to um, uh, take our money back and we did not persist with that. Uh, but it's uh, there's another thing that we tested out. Um, to the joy of flying, uh, I call the plane Bravo, which is the last letter on the call sign uh, used by aircraft alphabet. Uh, I found a lot of pleasure in watching others enjoy uh, the area. This is an area that most of you know called Cactus Bluff right next to Ferry Bluff, beautiful little, um, uh, nature uh, uh, posters along there for introducing people to the vegetation and animals and plants and the history of the area and a nice little edge in the limestone uh, cliffs to enjoy the, the scenery. It's a place along the river where it takes a sharp uh, bend from going due west to going due south and uh, just a lovely spot. This is a branch of the Wisconsin River, a very small branch. And this happened to be on uh, Labor Day morning or Sunday morning, I guess, of Labor Day weekend. And I was flying down this branch and pleased to see these people having breakfast. Again, because I had a, you can see my altitude, if this is the cowling in front of me, the, the nose of the plane, I mean, not the cowling. Uh, I'm right down to their level and below treetop height, uh, but I didn't have to worry about disturbing them. And they just waved cheerily as they were having their breakfast. Uh, but it, that's the sort of flying that uh, I like to do. But, and it's not just in the summertime. You can fly in the winter perfectly well. The battery's not quite as efficient, but you can see how much energy you have in percentage points, not just in quarter tank full, et cetera. So you know exactly how much uh, energy you have left in the battery. This is the Merrimack Ferry. It's been covered up for the winter. And this is the railroad bridge that goes across from Lodi to Merrimack and Lake, the upper reaches of, of uh, uh, Lake Wisconsin. This is another wintertime scene a little later in the winter going over quite near Ferry Bluff. And this is a bald eagle nest here in the center. And uh, you can see the, both the parents there, they've got the nest ready. Um, an interesting thing about bald eagles, when I approach 
this this picture was taken or photo was taken as I was flying pretty much horizontally, but possibly climbing a tiny bit to make sure I give them a clear distance. Uh, so you can't see what direction they're looking, but they're not even looking at me or paying any attention. And what I also notice is when I enter the river, I usually come going this way uh, and I'm, I'm throttling back from a higher elevation, but I get back just to clear these trees and I'm practically silent because the motor is just idling and they don't even turn their heads to look at me. I can be close enough to see into their eyes and they don't even bother to look. These are fearless birds and you only realize it when you fly. Even with this quieter plane, seagulls get nervous if I get within a couple of hundred feet. And um, also uh, uh, even the pelicans and some of the other birds, uh, cranes especially. Uh, so I, I respect their, their shyness and, and don't harass them. But I never get the feeling that I was bothering the eagles at all. They just uh, they had other things on their minds besides this silly guy on an electric ultralight flying by. Uh, this is an example of seagulls. Uh, they just stand in the in the water sometimes um, and catch the little minnows as they swim by. Uh, you can see this is a little bit of a sandbar just showing up in a little riffle of the current here along the river. And this is another part of the river further down. And I wonder why these things didn't flutter around. So I got down lower and lower and lower and realized those are decoys that hunters had set out in this little backwater off the river. And uh, so sometimes uh, you can do that. You can see I'm down pretty, pretty low here. I mentioned this location because I want you to take a notice of this island. Uh, there's a sandbar on this side, a substantial size sandbar. The main course of the river is here. And this is looking toward Madison uh, in a southeasterly direction on the far shore. Uh, the so-called nude beach is further upriver. And, um, but notice that island. The next picture I'm gonna show is looking up that way, north. And, uh, and I'll show you, just to give you an idea where it was. That's that island that I just showed you coming from the, looking at this direction toward, across the river toward the southeast. And this is Bravo uh, after a forced landing on that sandbar that I showed you before. Now, this was in last October the 20th. Uh, what happened was um, I'd had Mark come and we'd gone over the plane with a fine tooth comb and we got, uh, I had some problems with some blown fuses. And so we really worked at it aggressively for about four days and got the plane ship shape and we both test flew it and everything seemed fine. And um, uh, I got down and I, this is a typical turning point. So I was turning around uh, that day, a very gentle turn and suddenly the motor quit. And um, I was a rather disconcerting feeling uh, because uh, I either had to land in the river or the trees or the sandbar. And fortunately the sandbar was there. I guess it was a good idea that I turned there uh, because it offered, it provided a perfectly good landing spot and uh, a plane wasn't damaged and I certainly wasn't uh, anything uncomfortable, just a little excited inside for uh, having been forced into this situation. To make a long story short, a um, uh, few days later, I was able to uh, uh, get some friends and we helped with this little pontoon. This is an inflatable raft with five compartments that will carry 1,100 pounds. So the plane only weighs 600, so we didn't have much trouble once we rolled it off of that island that I was pointing out to you, rolled it over to the water's edge and inflated the different compartments. Uh, we were able to um, uh, take it up, tie down the main wheels and the nose wheel and take it up to a place where we could um, uh, take the plane apart and, and take it back to the hangar. Um, but it was in, in, in a very in, inaccessible location there and needed to be taken up by water. Um, to make a a long story short of short, um, I was able to get it working again up to a point, but I noticed that there's a little thing called a bike board that is meant for this electric motorcycle that I got the, that Mark uh, uh, used the electrical components. It was all beautifully matched. So you had a built-in uh, battery monitoring system and a built-in controller and all that. But um, um, the bike board, had not been altered to tell it that it was no longer a motorcycle, but an airplane. 
and uh, because the company doesn't make components for airplanes, they just make them for their bikes. And um, in the past, it had been, but this new bike board that I had didn't have that intelligence. And so when I was making even a gentle turn, uh, the plane thought that the motorcycle had fallen over and therefore quit, uh, because that's what you do for an electric motorcycle. So uh, at that point, I decided that that really, although it's been a wonderful five years, that probably given my age and given the uh, status of the uh, incompatibility of electric motorcycles and electric airplanes, it was probably time to put it for sale. So the plane is is uh, for sale. It needs some a little bit of fuse work, but otherwise it's fine and, and should be fixable. But I, I frankly uh, have kind of lost my confidence in the technology still, we've, we've got a ways to go. Now, coming back to general electric aviation for a little while, let me bring you up to date here. There's a company on the West Coast in Vancouver actually called Harbor Air, that's why they spell Harbor with a U. And um, they fly beavers, and um, which is this kind of a plane or a bigger plane here called an otter. And you can see the Harbor Air on the fuselage here. Uh, they fly out of Vancouver to Seattle and Victoria and various places up the west coast of British Columbia. It's a thriving company, uh, but recently they teamed up with Magnets, which makes uh, electric motors, a uh, very popular company to thriving, and H55 makes remarkable batteries. So the three companies, the airline, the electric motor bank, and the battery company have gotten together and they're doing well. Uh, they're increasing their flying time. They're not doing it commercially yet. They're using internal combustion engines for their commercial services, but they hope to get the battery for some of their short runs, I think in the future. Uh, but I'm, I, I salute them for their efforts to uh, reduce air pollution and carbon emissions. This is a, a, another uh, person who decided by the name of Chip Yates. And what you're seeing here is a popular design by Bert Rattan. Most of you have never heard of him, but he has what's called, he makes planes that are called canards. It's French for a duck. And that design of aircraft has most of the lift in the back wing and just a little leveler uh, uh, things in these little winglets at the front. Uh, they're very efficient. They have a pusher engine. And what he's done is put in a pusher motor. And he says he has the world's fastest electric airplane. And it was the first one to break 200 miles an hour. Uh, he wanted to go to across the Atlantic Ocean and have these little uh, uh, aircraft carriers set up for charging him along the way. I don't think that ever happened, but it was an interesting dream. And he's on display here at Oshkosh talking about his plane. Um, he certainly made some progress, but his dreams, I think, are, are perhaps beyond reality. This, these other folks uh, like Ampere, they, they are a little more practical. They take a, an established um, I think this is a, a Cessna design called the caravan. They call it an eco caravan because it's a hybrid. And they think it's the first hybrid electric regional aircraft. Um, they can cut their emissions and consumption by 70% using sustainable air aviation fuel. I don't know the details of, uh, of the composition of that fuel, but they say they can operate it uh, uh, by reducing the costs and uh, seat per mile. This package I think here has a, a, a battery system and they can have some electric supply, just like a hybrid car, I guess, <coughs> and use uh, uh, electricity when they're in cruise. So you could use the uh, gasoline on takeoff when they need a lot of power and uh, cruise at uh, reduced throttle settings. So they, they're, uh, that's one approach. Uh, then there's this approach. Um, it's a company called Eviation, E standing, of course, for electric, and they just took off the A. They call the plane Alice, and the top photograph shows a static display. In other words, it wasn't fully operational. Uh, it's a pretty classy looking plane. With, we call it a tail dragger, and uh, with the wheels here retractable. Quite a clean plane, a V tail, and an electric pro uh, driven propeller at the back. Unfortunately, you can't see it very well with this other aircraft in the behind it, uh, but it's kind of a stunning looking plane. Uh, nine passengers, uh, 57 feet long, wingspan 63 feet, and so on. Uh, 
what I thought was interesting was this, they've modified it now. Uh, this was in 2019, I think, or 2018. This was more recently off their website. I think it's just flying uh, digitally here. Um, but they've switched the, the V tail, again, I think recognizing that they're not as practical as they look at first to a, a better, more functional uh, horizontal tail up on the end of a fin. And they've got uh, uh, two electric motors uh, that are called uh, uh, Magnix. Again, the same company working with Harbor. These are uh, electrical power units, uh, 940 horsepower each. Uh, so lots of power back there, and uh, uh, but purely electric, no gasoline. Service ceiling, uh, 32,000 feet. Uh, cruise altitude, typically 10,000. Uh, so they're uh, they have flown, um, but just for short distances uh, so far. But there's no evidence of FAA certification any time in the near future, but it might happen sooner than we think. Who knows? I, I'm, of course, being an amphibian pilot, um, I'm attracted by this plane called Jecta. It's a Swiss made plane. Um, I like the idea of uh, 19 seats or so. Uh, they think they can fly up to 94 miles along coastal cities. They plan to use natural waterways instead of large airports. So reducing some of the uh, uh, time off of airports and, and uh, using waterways. I think it's kind of cool. I don't know if they will make it or not, but uh, they are optimistic and I hope I wish them all, all success. Uh, I'm jumping. Now you could, you could go to about 20 more uh, companies but uh, I'm jumping to this guy because he's pretty remarkable and he looks like he's going to be a winner. Probably uh, sometime late next year, he will have a certification for this plane called the S4. It's a, he founded the company, his name is Joe Ben Berwert, but he, uh, he calls his company Joby. It's been going now for uh, 12, 13 years. He has a lot of money from Uber, Delta Airlines and Toyota, as well as he sold directly to the Department of Defense and they're working with some of his planes. So he's off to a good start and I'll spend a little time showing you more details about it. It's called the S4 Taxi. You can Google the Joby S4 Taxi and see videos that are quite interesting. Uh, these are various pictures from that. Um, what's interesting to me is that you can not only just tilt the motors here, <coughs> excuse me, there are six of them, you can see four of them along the front wing and two on the tips of the back wing. But notice the blades, they're much thicker and they're much shorter and they're bent a little bit. Uh, with tips are tipped down just a little bit. Those are important things to notice. This wand here won't necessarily always be this long. He's using it for some careful uh, testing of air speeds and pressures, etc. cetera. Uh, but it's a remarkable looking plane. What I wanted to bring to your attention was you can't do this very easily with an internal combustion engine. There's very, very little vibration in electric motors compared with an internal combustion engine, as you might expect, you're using magnetic draw as opposed to explosions. And so you can actually uh, have a motor that you can turn its mounts up and still it's actually supporting and lifting the plane. And yet it's turned up at, uh, at 90 degrees to the direction of it. So you don't have to move the whole nacelle around like you do here in these two inboard ones, um, they can just tip them around and get them well away from the, from the cockpit. Um, it seats, it has a crew of, of one and the passengers four. Uh, and these are the different flight altitudes. This is during the lift phase here uh, and then turning it into cruise phase. And there's a wing here uh, that you can appreciate better from this view. So that it actually flies uh, although it's now getting ready for descent and the, the motors have been turned up to allow it to descend mostly and just coast in. But in flight, these propellers are all in front and you can see this is a sizable wing here as well as back here, the, the, the tail. So it's, a, it's a, you're basically taking the best of the helicopter to vertical flight and the best of an air, airplane for horizontal flight and combining them um, he also has tip speeds of the propeller that are about half that of a helicopter. Uh, and that allows him 
to have, these are noise levels for a Sirius, which is a typical plane that you would have at Maurice, uh, uh, a Beechcraft Baron, a twin engine. Um, not sure if Baron is twin, might, might be a single. In any case, it's a, it's a standard internal combustion engine. This is a helicopter internal combustion engines. The bell is well known, Leonardo not so much so. The blue is indicating the, uh, I suppose the standard deviation and the, the sound here, sound, sound is, is accumulated with time. And then you come to the Joby and you see uh, uh, a much flatter uh, thing, remarkably quiet. Uh, but it does require some special thing. In a typical internal combustion powered airplane, uh, you need to have the propulsion, and in this case, this would be a fuel of some sort, to make about a third of the total mass of the aircraft. So you have about two thirds for the payload and everything else. But you notice here, because of the uh, significant battery uh, and propulsion weight, uh, but mostly battery, uh, you have to cut back on the payload and everything else. So, uh, but they're quite uh, aware of it. This range is 150 miles. So this is significantly more than Bravo's 30 to 40 miles. And, uh, uh, can do some significant amount of, of flights from a major airport like Los Angeles to small, uh, uh, just flat areas, maybe on top of buildings and things uh, in the Los Angeles area. There are six propellers. Each can, it can fly safely with the loss of any one propeller. Each motor is redundant and powered by two separate inverters. These are these uh, inverters to change uh, um, uh, direct current to charge current batteries to uh, three phase alternating current. Each inverter is wired to a separate battery pack and uh, there are four isolated and redundant uh, battery packs in green here. Uh, and the motor continues to function if an inverter or battery pack fails. So it's lots of redundancy in this. And this would be example of areas in downtown Los Angeles or other places where this plane might be flying off of. Uh, this is this was the uh, location here of I think that somewhere in this vicinity, perhaps that one, Los Angeles is going to the main airport, and you can see all these uh, inter inter networks of of flights that could reduce huge amounts of traffic in people who uh, want to have efficient uh, uh, commuting from their pocket airports. They anticipate uh, forty two thousand trips per day. Um, with this system, uh, that's just in the one city area. So Toyota has gotten involved. They're sharing their expertise in manufacturing quality and cost controls in the development uh, throughout this uh, aircraft. They've invested 394 million as a lead investor in Joby's financing. Um, uh, this was an April Fool's joke that I noticed on the website. <laughs> They've got the April Fool's joke was that Apple had just given quite a few billion dollars uh, and decided to buy the company, which was just a, uh, a funny little joke that they did last April the 1st. Uh, but uh, uh, there are many other contenders for future roles in aviation needs beside Joby. I thought it was, it was a fascinating aircraft because of its unique features and using electric motors in special ways. I have to acknowledge that when hydrogen technology has developed beyond its current levels, a greater travel range will allow a wider variety of of e-planes and, and hydrogen planes to compete with uh, our hydrocarbon fuel design. Uh, so before we leave this field, I want to touch uh, give touch on Eric Raymond. He I met uh, briefly at some of these innovative meetings in California. He learned about efficient flight from Paul McCready. Some of you may have heard of the Gossamer Condor and various other planes that Paul McCready designed to be flown across the English Channel and uh, by pedaling, not by batteries. This was 20 years ago. <coughs> but uh, Eric Raymond learned about efficient design and batteries. And he has coated the sailplane uh, with gallium arsenide uh, flexible solar cells. And he has a 10 kilowatt hour battery, uh, but he gets about 30 kilowatt hour uh, kilowatts at any moment on a sunny day. Uh, from uh, these, these solar panels. He loves to fly through the Italian Alps. Um, his note from his website says, 
he calls this the Sun Seeker Duo because it's dual seat. Uh, he's the most advanced solar powered airplane in the world. It's, uh, uh, this is his third plane from this company, able to cruise directly on solar power with two people on board. The structure is light, aerodynamically efficient enough to perform well uh, with uh, power from integrated solar cells uh, alone. It uses a battery pack located in the fuselage just to store the energy and to dish it out as needed. The sun is refueling the batteries whilst it's in flight, allowing green and sustainable air travel. He has folding wings so that the plane can, um, can be in a hangar footprint no larger than a conventional plane and it can be disassembled and packed into a trailer. It was first flown uh, 10 years ago and has now logged several hundred hours in the air and carry, as he puts it mildly, more than a few passengers. Uh, this is a picture of Ray and his wife, Irena, flying over these Alps here. Uh, sorry about that. <clears throat> and uh, this is a map of where they, they have several homes, I think, <laughs> but uh, the main one is, is in, uh, I think, possibly in Italy uh, or Slovenia, but there are routes and um, uh, you can see how they've gone down the length of Italy to Sicily and across uh, uh, from the Italian Alps into southern France uh, in Spain. So they have quite a range of areas that they fly. It uh, might not give them the jollies of flying along a, a Wisconsin River, but Certainly the scenery there is not uh, uh, dull and uh, uh, they seem to enjoy their, their uh, ventures well. Just a couple of pictures that I happened to come across as I was putting this together. And it made me think about the differences between the United States and Europe. In the United States, um, if you look at EAA today, they were pioneers in, in getting people interested in electric aviation. Uh, 12 years ago, but you don't see very much about electric planes there anymore. Uh, this is a typical airport somewhere uh, in the States. Uh, people are just like private jets. Uh, they get a little bored with the, uh, with the uh, airlines. And so these people either have private uh, twin cylinder airplanes or private jets. And this is a, an airport where they're stacked up. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a deep interest until batteries get a lot better. Uh, in electric aviation in the United States. I seem to feel that it's declining, if anything. It's certainly not getting much stronger. Now, I can't talk very much about electric planes either in Europe, but what they've done, they don't have the money, but they want to have fun. So they, they build ultralights, and the ultralight has really thrived in Europe, in contrast to the United States, where the ultralight has really fallen into uh, just, just a lack of interest. And what they like to do, particularly in France, is take people up and they put them in the front seat and the guy has a, has a caged propeller so that, uh, and it's a pusher so that it's out of the way of the birds. He has a parasol type wing and the geese in Europe, there are several types of geese um, that like to fly. And for some reason or other, they just like to come to fly. I don't think they, they get used to them. They can catch in the wave. As you know, if you're behind a, uh, a motorboat and there's a wave sprawling out and people can can uh, uh, water ski along behind a boat on the crest of the wave and that's kind of fun. Well the birds can do that with, an, with a compression wave in the air and this pilot, uh, 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 person I mean, here has brought a accordion along to play music. I'm not sure how well the birds can hear that over the noise but this must be muffled down quite a bit. In any case, I don't know why they brought their accordion along. But these people love to put their hands up and just touch the soft, smooth feathers, and the birds don't seem to mind at all. Uh, I've seen videos. If you want to Google, um, it's, uh, I think you can Google birds flying with airplanes or something like that. I've forgotten the words I chose, but you can get the, these. Some of them are in French and some in English, and, and they just have, it doesn't matter the words. It's really fun to see the joy these people have flying with, uh, with geese in Europe. So I just have that contrast. Um, I think they're, uh, they just don't have the money in Europe by and large, unless you're a Russian oligarch. And uh, uh, so they, the ultralights have thrived there in contrast to this country. Uh, and so these are my final comments. 
uh, three lessons I've learned and some future predictions. Since 2010, my impatience for electric planes to evolve into a personal plane has been an exciting adventure, but it's included disappointments. And I've noticed that batteries, they're evolving, but they're evolving very slowly over the 12 years I've been involved. Today, for those who can afford small e-commuter flights from pocket airports, there is a much brighter e-plane future as I outlined in the Joby system. And to the last uh, couple of slides, solar assisted electric flight as with Eric Raymond will remain an elusive dream unless one is an experienced aero engineer like Eric. I talked to some people at those innovative uh, meetings about how much it would take to put solar panels on Bravo's wing. And the estimate was uh, $30,000 and don't expect to get them anytime soon. Probably you'd have to wait another 10 years because they're busy supplying other people with many more of them. So it's nice that other companies and so on and innovators with more money are getting them. But for the private market of the ultralight uh, pilot, um, those nice uh, solar uh, panels are still uh, quite a ways away. So I'll um, open it up to questions and stop the screen share so that I can maybe see you and see each other as we converse with any questions you might have. Um, I'll go to the chat function, see, here, see what we have. Not coming up there, sorry. Anybody want to raise their hand? Yes, Dottie. Let me unmute you. I just unmuted myself. Um, what you didn't really cover is what use Joby will use. Why is there this great interest in putting the money in? Is this going to be like an air taxi service, a commercial service that it's going to be used in big cities. Uh, yes. What is the purpose? Yes, that's it exactly. Sorry if I didn't convey that. I meant to. Uh, that's the idea. I had that network where people could. Uh, he talked about having forty-two thousand flights a day. Uh, that's quite a service, and it would take uh, a lot of people off the highways um, around Los Angeles. He would like to do that. I think uh, elsewhere as well. The Department of Defense is uh, watching him closely are testing some of his airplanes. They might have some value in the military as well, um, but uh, um, I think we are much more interested in non-military uses of his plane. But yeah, it's, it's a basically a, an Uber taxi service. I, I think a lot of the, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I think a lot of the CEOs don't like to sit in traffic in LA. Yeah. And so they want to just be able to you know, hop over the traffic in, in these uh, electric aircraft and, and land on the top of their headquarters building. Yeah. It just saves them a lot of time um, because these people are so highly paid, you know, obviously you don't want to <laughs> waste waste the, their time, you know, sitting in traffic. I agree. I, I mean, if, if you have the money, um, uh, it's, it's at least uh, a non-polluting way to... Uh, to improve efficiency. Um, it's a shame that, you know, in certain cities in Europe, in London and Paris and elsewhere, you can take a metro from downtown to the airport, um, but you can't do that uh, readily in Los Angeles and uh, in a number of other cities. So yeah, that would be a, a convenient way. Did, did you have a chance to finish your question, Dottie? No, I did want to, uh, to ask another question sure. that was related not to a completely electric aircraft, but I understood that larger commercial planes were interested in being able being able to electrify more components of flight to make things more efficient, if not the actual propulsion. Are you did you do any study of that aspect of electrification? No, not. Not excessively, but I have read, of course, about this over the years. There was some initial enthusiasm about five years ago of electrifying the wheels of aircraft. And so that uh, uh, they'd be able to taxi out 
uh, electrically and then fire up the engines once they could see that they were uh, number three to take off or something like that. That ha idea hasn't caught on, probably for two reasons. The pilots are accustomed to uh, to uh, using their engines and testing them while they're taxiing them, and they don't um, seem to take on to the idea very enthusiastically. And the other is, in the early stages of that, they had some battery fires in the aircraft, and that scared a lot of people. So um, I think the combination of the two, I haven't seen it actually come to fruition. There's been talk about it, but I haven't seen it happen. Thank you. I just uh, some comments on what, what I've read um, regarding, it seems like a, a training airplane would be a, a good place to use a, an yeah. electric motor. Um, but the, the reality has been so far that uh, it runs the battery so far down that there's a long time in charging. Yeah. And if the, even if they have a high speed DC charging, it uh, creates so much heat that they have to have special air conditioners to, to cool off the batteries while, while they're charging them to, in order to use the plane in any reasonable amount of time. So it, it's, I'm not going to call it a failure. It just shows one of the problems with, with going electric airplane. Also, there's absolutely zero infrastructure for recharging a, an airplane, as Richard knows, from one place to the other. I looked into it for my EAA chapter. We we're upgrading the electrical system on our Broadhead Airport, and I asked for a charging spot for e-planes, and uh, I ended up calling Siemens and asked, uh, what's what's standard for plug for airplanes? And they said, there's no such thing. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> that's as far as I've gotten. Yeah, it, it's a very, very good point, Alan. Thank you for bringing that up. It's, uh, you know, fortunately in the electric car business, we have Tesla who has made a point of, of getting efficient uh, stations and putting them all across the country. Um, but that hasn't happened yet. We're a long way from that with airplanes. And uh, I had uh, quite a struggle with uh, getting to Oshkosh and back efficiently because with just one little charger at 110 volts, uh, you need an overnight charge. And uh, you really need 220 and preferably two chargers at once if you're gonna efficiently uh, charge up a plane. So um, so it, it really means some dedicated effort on the part of the FBO or fixed base operator. Um, but I uh, agree with you that uh, um, in California, this was tried by uh, uh, Pipistrelle. They sold uh, pairs of uh, their, their electric uh, planes at a time so they could be charging up one while the other one was flying. And they did have some problems with uh, warming, keeping the engines cool. Of course, in California, there's often on hot days, uh, but uh, uh, I think the, the really popular thing was the cost of the flying lesson uh, usually includes at one point or another, the cost of the fuel and the cost of the flying lesson, I think was about one third when you went to electric planes as opposed to internal combustion. So for somebody to want to train, it, it was great. But then the problem becomes, then you learn how to fly an electric plane, but you don't learn anything about all the complexities of uh, carburetor heat, et cetera, et cetera, for, an internal combustion engine, so you still have to get that time uh, if you want to be a general aviation pilot. So it uh, it has its good and its bad, and it's going to take a while. <laughs> good good point. Any other comments or questions out there? Richard, did you ever have any um, idea what caused your um, shorts in a, that? To you know, cause those fuses to blow on the Bravo? Yeah, um, there are two causes. Uh, the first is that uh, uh, there's very complicated bike board. It's, it's like a little mini computer in these electric motorcycles. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got my first system, it was working and uh, everything was, was set up so that 
the plane, the brains of the plane in the bike board realized that it was not a bike, but an airplane. And there's a thing called a kickstand in these electric uh, motorcycles. And you want to make sure your kickstand is up and out of the way and that sort of thing. And that was all looked after. But, um, but you need an expert who does a good job and can and make all these adjustments. And when I got my upgrade um, at one point, I think that's when the potential for problems arose because when I got back to repairing it afterwards, I managed to get it running in the hangar at low RPM so it wasn't blowing everything around and it was a cool winter day. And I got the, uh, the bike board out and I had it in my hand like this. And the RPM was just going at a nice RPM. And I turned the bike board over in my hand and the motor quit instantly. And it must have blown some other circuits because when I turned it back, it did not start again. And so I know that I tried to replace some other obvious fuses and that wasn't sufficient. And so there are, there are complex, it's a multi-cause uh, problem. And uh, I, at that point I decided, okay, enough's enough. But uh, for me personally, uh, but I have a, a certain age factor uh, to consider and, but I, I'm very reluctantly giving it up. I personally feel that I would, I would sure love to keep on flying, but I think we have to be realistic and sometimes accept the messages that we get. But to right. answer your question more, more, you know, it's probably uh, multifactorial, but uh, the problem I think is you need to have not only a system that's cohesive that Mark had done, but instead of lifting it from an electric motorcycle, which is all he had to go by as a little ultralight manufacturer, uh, kit maker, uh, you need to find a company such as Harbor Air is finding with uh, Magnix and Eviation is also finding with the same company. You need to find a company that will dedicate itself to having all the software set up for an aircraft, not an electric bike or something else. So, sure. That's just an extra complication you don't need. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> the reason I asked is because I don't know if you remember my Saturn EV, the conversion. Yes, I do. Um, uh, I used to blow a fuse in that, the major fuse uh, uh, leading, the, you know, from the motor um, or to the motor. Uh, I, I would blow that about once a year. <laughs> and uh, I never could figure out, uh, you know, what was causing it. It seemed like it would happen when I'd make a sudden turn or something like that. Yeah. So we weren't sure if there was like a short, you know, like some wires were hitting into each other when I was, you know, taking a sharp turn. Um, so, you know, I, I, I still to this day have no idea other than I, I do wonder if something could be going on with the motor controller as well. I mean, those are not very complicated vehicles. I mean, there's not much to them. There's a battery pack, an electric motor, a motor controller, and a potentiometer, and that's about it. That's all that's in those. And so um, there's not a lot to go wrong, really. <laughs> well, you, you not only you have that, but you also have an inconvenience if, you're, uh, if you run into that problem. If you're in the air, it's a little more than an inconvenience. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't do what you do, Richard. <laughs> I'm not that brave. <laughs> well, <laughs> it was it was sometimes I have to look back, thinking back a little bit foolhardy. I think it was also impatience on my part. I just uh, I really wanted to mix my favorite hobby of flying along the river with uh, uh, the efficiency of my little Honda Insight. And, uh, <laughs> uh, it's it's a tall order, right? I even have a there's a specialist in Sauk City, not very far away from the hangar, by the name of Eric Powers. And he and I uh, were co-founders of Hybrid Fest in Madison back in 2006. And uh, so he's an old friend and he, he, his business now is fixing hybrid cars and making them work. And so I had him come over and work on the plane with me. And he was a very nice guy willing to do so, but uh, it was beyond him too. <laughs> Challenging. Yeah, okay, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure and I appreciate you folks uh, coming on board today for an unusual topic, um, sort of two of my pets, birds and electric planes. And um, uh, Doug is gonna uh, bring us back to reality now, down to earth, I could say, uh, for, with alternatives to cement and concrete. 
this is really an important topic. And I recommend that I'm looking forward to it very much. Uh, I think Doug has done some good research and I'm looking forward to hearing about it uh, because the, uh, uh, the when, when we, we use cement to make concrete, it, it uh, absorbs uh, some CO2 from the air. But the problem is, is, is Doug will show us, uh, to make the cement in the first place. From limestone, it releases a huge amount of CO2. And we need to find another way to do that. I'm looking forward to that very much. And Alan will be talking to us a week after that on photovoltaic energy and future implications. Uh, that I look forward to. And while you're on the, the line, uh, uh, Lee, you could tell us a wee little bit, if you'd like, about the, our field trip on April the 3rd. And, and I'm suggesting that maybe we, rather than trying to carpool, we could perhaps just drive there and use that address, uh, 4151 Nakusa Trail. Any comments on that timing? I'm, I'm going to have to get my, with my hands and, uh, you know, okay. make the final arrangements and that kind of thing. In fact, okay. uh, I'm going to shoot him an email today and, and get that started. That's great. That'd be nice. I did look him up on web and he's a, He's a very uh, stimulating, vibrant speaker. So I, I think we're going to enjoy him as an individual. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, good. Okay. And so uh, um, I'm going to have to wreck my brains to come up with some more talks for this fall. But uh, I really appreciate the speakers who've, who are to follow uh, now for the rest of the sessions. Uh, they all, I think, uh, look like very informative speakers. And I'm I look forward to them all and to the rest of the spring season with you. So uh, we'll say so long at this uh, hour of 11.27. Hope you have a good week. And uh, uh, we'll look forward to hearing from Doug a week from today. Thank you all for coming. Bye-bye.